Hey guys, it's Alexandra. Today I'm going to be talking to Polly who um, does trauma release. She also has traveled through India to learn yoga. She's trekked through Nepal. Um, she talks about her belief that women should own their sexuality. Uh, she just turned 50 years old, so she's got a lot of wisdom and insight to share, but she looks like she's like 25. So mentally and physically, I think um, she's a huge inspiration and there's a lot we could learn from her. So I hope that you will stay tuned to hear more about her and subscribe for more videos. All right, thank you. The best way to explain this is if I, not that I would, but like, let's just say someone's going to try and hit you. You would automatically flinch. You would try to protect yourself, right? Your body automatically does that. Well, that tension that is now stored as trauma. Okay. So anytime that something happens, just whether we have a, a, a broken heart, like a, a breakup, you know, we feel it. Sometimes we feel like we're dying, you know, cause we're so sad. So we feel it. So, so that tension and that trauma is actually stored in the muscles and organs and tissues of our body just as if we're in a car wreck or, or a, a loss of I don't know, a family member or someone that we care about, anything like that, our body absorbs all that pain, you know? And a lot of people think that, you know, it's emotion is not physical, but it is. It's like, I always say emotion is energy in motion. And so when it doesn't have a release as nowhere to go, our body becomes very toxic. You know, we, we start to have all these blockages throughout our body. So what I do is I do a, crazy how I do it. I'm not really sure why I've been gifted this way, but um, I'm actually able to realign people's bodies just with my hands. Yeah. And so it's hard. I know it's kind of, it's hard to explain um, until you actually experience it. Um, you can feel your body start to shift and move on its own. You can feel your spine start to elongate. You can start, I could feel the pains in your body and where your blockages are. And so I do that first for someone like, well, I like, Monday I had a class and we did that. And then we go through this process of releasing the trauma that stores. I put you through a series of exercises and then you're laying down on a mat, you know, in a really safe, secured place. And I'm watching, not like watching you, but I'm making sure that you don't disassociate, you know, like fight, flight or freeze. So any kind of trauma that starts to come up, some people feel like it's an emotional trauma. Like they're going to be transported back to that moment, but it's not, it's just your body trying to release things. So your body starts to kind of shake and start to move slowly. And it's, there's a, it's like a, um, it's a deep vibration inside of your body. And it's actually the muscles and tissues and organs of your body starting to release that trauma, that tension that's stored in your body. And so it's amazing. Yeah, it's, it's so amazing. And then we follow that with yoga nidra. So that deep guided meditation where you go into this deep delta recovery sleep. So like if we did an hour of that, that's actually equal to four hours of deep delta sleep. So when you get done with that, it's not like I'm asking you to tell me about the experiences that you've had that led you to this moment that's made you feel unhappy or you don't understand why I'm having so much back pain, but I carry a lot of stress in there. And I, I just, I'm a very closed off person. I can't share that, you know? So I'm asking you just to lay down and just relax and your body allows it to happen naturally. I, it, it's so hard to explain. It's the hardest thing. I, I hardly ever talk about it because it's so um, it's so difficult to put into words, um, what it actually does for you. Um, but what I can tell you what the people feel the next day, or even after they leave the class, they feel like this huge weight is lifted off of them. They can feel that the weight of that energy that's stored in their body is gone and they sleep so peaceful that night and they feel this really euphoric sense of happiness for several days after that. And so I'm always like, let's keep continuing this, moving through that kind of trauma that's in your body, releasing it. So does that, I know it's so hard to explain. It's like so difficult. <laughs> How did you get interested in that? Oh my gosh. Um, let's see, you know, one, I pay attention to signs, you know, I pay attention to, you know, people saying you should do this, or this is something that you would be interested in. I always feel like those are little nuggets or gifts from the universe telling you kind of carving out your path. So my path is not very conventional. So I, I wish I could have just went to school and said, Oh, this is what I want to be. But everything that I've learned is just kind of all over the place. So when I first got into the trauma release, I was going to see this lady and she did cranial sacral massage. And my oldest daughter who's now 30. Um, she was 24, 25 at the time. And, um, she had cheered most of her life. So her knees were really, really messed up. And so she started to compete and she had all these issues. And 
the lady that was working on it said, you know, your mom actually has it too. It's hereditary, like all the physical structures. And she, she started wanting to work on me. And she says, you know what? I think that you just have a lot of trauma in your body. You really need to check into this trauma release. And I was like, okay, I can do that. You know, like she had talked about it and I thought, all right, fine. And so when I found out the founder that was doing this was having a class and he never teaches, I immediately just booked it and flew and learned about it. And then from there, I started learning about yoga nidra. And so that's a whole nother story. I went to, an, an, I lived at an ashram for a little bit, went into this immersion program, started studying about yoga nidra and how that deep delta sleep is a recovery sleep. So I knew that they were linking itself together, you know, like releasing that trauma. And then I thought, how, how can I help people even more? You know, so when I came back to Oklahoma, um, I started working with the local firefighters. And so I would go to their stations and they would close their, close their stations down so I could work with them because a lot of them after seeing, you know, they might be firefighters, but they're not just seeing fires. They're seeing death. You know what I'm saying? Car wrecks. They're going on, you know, they're first responders. They're the first ones on the scenes for something that's, you know, like horrific, you know? And so they are not supposed to show emotion. They have a set routine that they're supposed to go through to get things done. So when after they get done with the call, their bodies would be so tight. And so they started having me work with them. So I'm just, I know it's kind of like, this is what's been happening. Like I just been learning my way through this and I just knew that this is what people need. I started feeling this real sense of peace after doing it myself. Right. I know. So you, you studied yoga in India, right? Yes, I did. Yeah. So what was, was that tough. like? Oh my gosh. It was brutal. Um, just because you pay and you go, it doesn't matter how much money you pay and you go when you live and you stay down there. It doesn't mean you're going to graduate. And we'll tell you that it was one of, I mean, I did, but it was one of the hardest things in my entire life. Um, I didn't re I was searching for something at more, you know, like the kind of yoga that I was familiar with, um, in the state of Oklahoma was not the kind of yoga that I grew up learning. And I wanted to dive deeper. And I love the yoga nidra process. And so going to India and living there at this institute, it was, um, it was brutal. It, I mean, I'm, I'm, when I look back at videos that I did or, you know, posts that I post about it, um, I literally was crying all the time. I cried every day. It was so hard. I had no idea that it wasn't just a physical practice. It was so much more. The physical practice of yoga is just one eighth of the whole practice of what yoga really is. A lot of us think it's just the physical, you know, and getting in shape and becoming flexible, but there's so much more to the, the mind work that you have to go through. Um, I probably slept about two and a half, three hours um, a night for the first 27 days. Oh. <laughs> It do was you brutal. feel like, do you feel like um, any of your own traumas have been um, released through your work? Oh yeah, definitely. I think that was one of the, you know, like we always start out like anything that we do, and I'm sure you can relate to this. You want to help other people and that's why we do what we do, you know? Um, but through the process of helping other people, we start to help ourselves. You know, we're always wanting to give, um, for someone else before giving for ourselves, you know? Um, so I was in my mind, I was thinking I was doing all this work uh, to help my partner at the time who was a retired firefighter. Um, my daughter who was a recovering addict, you know, I, I thought I was helping all these different people. Um, but when I started going through the process, I realized I had a lot of my own traumas that I, I thought my life was normal, you know, the way I grew up. Um, and it probably is normal, which is sad to say, you know, um, but going through the process, I started to unravel all these pains that I was dealing with. And one of the most difficult parts was when I was in India and it talks about breathing, you know, and how to breathe and what you should breathe. And we did so much pranayama work, so much meditation and the chanting, and there's so much breath work that goes along with it. I literally was blacking out. Like I couldn't remember how to teach a class. I couldn't remember what I just learned. I didn't understand why I was having so many issues with my memory. And I realized that I was actually like a reverse breather. And so because of all the trauma that I had lived through up to that point, I had learned to breathe a certain way that kind of like um, most people that survive traumatic events, you know, or going through PTSD, they, um, they breathe backwards 
And so I had been breathing backwards most of my life up until that point. And then I started to learn how to breathe properly, you know, to reverse that. And it was causing so much conflict in my mind um, that I was having these moments where I couldn't remember anything. But it was key to the big transformation that I made, you know, because after India, I went solo trekking through Nepal and I felt like I could do anything. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. So what was that? What, is, what did you do when you were solo trekking? What did that involve? Uh, you know, I just kind of, I knew I was already going to India and I was so close to India that I thought to myself that, you know, I could just do a round trip ticket. It's so cheap. I'm already there. I should just extend my stay and just, you know, leave all my baggage down, you know, at the school and then fly up to Nepal. And then when I trek around for a while and then fly back down and pick up all my stuff and fly back, um, I literally was just winging it. I had no plan at all. I, um, I knew I was going to get off the flight and just try to figure out where I was going to stay and, and kind of like move through the valleys of Kathmandu, you know, uh, I had no plan at all, but it was the most liberating experience. It, it was, I want to say that was the moment that um, my heart opened up. That was the moment that I felt um, cause you, people talk about feeling open and feeling at one or feeling at peace. I literally felt that way. I felt like, I felt so much gratitude when I was in Nepal, my heart opened and I felt like that changed everything. I came back to Oklahoma and it had a, like a, a different viewpoint, even on my family or the people that I saw, you know, it was, I was so open and willing to be vulnerable and raw when I was there. And I brought that back. I was like, there was a time when I was standing out, uh, walked out on this makeshift balcony and you could see Everest um, across the way. And it was always, kids got up really early to go to school, like four o'clock and they would dress in suits. They would, they literally did walk up and down mountains. You know what I'm saying? I could see them, you know, walking. And um, I walked out onto my balcony and I heard um, someone somewhere down below was playing a Jason Mraz song, you know, which was to me, my song. And I was like, wow, this is powerful. And then I could hear the kids way down in the valley singing. And at that moment, I just started crying. I totally felt open. I totally realized that there was so much more to life, you know, that they had so little there and they were so happy. And being here in America, we have so much and we're all struggling with happiness, you know? That's a good point. <laughs> Yeah, I um, do any of your piercings or tattoos, do they symbolize anything? I would love to know more about that. Yeah, I have so many on me. Um, let's see. Well, the one on my forehead and the ones across my chest and up through here, that, let's see, I got these recently. They are my newest ones. And um, one day, uh, I, it was... I hear things, you know, like a lot of people probably hear things, you know, and um, I don't know if you can, can you still hear me? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Cause this may shut off. I don't know, but um, I'll take them out if they do. But I, I was going through a really um, bad time in a relationship and um, I kind of knew that I needed to move past this relationship, you know, and I knew that there were things that I was looking for um, to, I guess, give me comfort in that moment. And I could feel someone shaking me and waking me and telling me to look, to get up. And so I remember getting up and I think I, I think I wrote about it, but I got up and I went to my bathroom and I was looking in the mirror and I kept hearing, you are a warrior. You are a warrior. And as I was turning and, I have a side mirror on one of my doors. Um, I looked in it and I felt like I was looking into like my past. I felt like I was, um, I had felt so alone for so long, you know, like you're always looking for that soulmate or someone to help you or complete you or make you feel normal. Um, when we actually, we are everything that we need, you know? And so when I looked in that mirror, I felt like I could see like my huge, like my ancestral line of people from way back, you know, cause I don't fit the stereotype of my family, <laughs> you know, at all. Um, and I remember hearing you are a warrior, you are a warrior. And I kept having this vision of what this tattoo was supposed to look like. And so I knew 
even when I was getting it done, that it was going to be very risky, you know, like it's on your forehead. People was like, do you really want to do that to your, you know, your face? You know what I'm saying? I'm like, I feel like it's supposed to be there. And so this one is actually, it's a Filipino tribal tattoo. It's not supposed to be on your forehead. Why I put it there. It told me to, why I got it in red. It told me to, so I did. Um, but it's a serpent and eagle. And so this last week when I was in Sedona, they were like, ah, here's some of your spirit animals are, you know, snake and eagle and owl. So it was just kind of like in alignment with it. Um, yeah, all these right here were just the elements. Um, I had no idea that those were the fifth element. I had no idea at the time. And I was like, did you know that you get that from the fifth element? I said, no, I didn't. I just thought they were just elements. I had no idea. Um, and the ones on my chest are um, where there's a will, there's a way and create your own reality. Um, my oldest daughter, we both went to go get tattoos that same day. Um, I didn't know what she was getting and she didn't know what I was getting. And she got the elements across her chest and her symbol. Yeah, it's it, sometimes we are so in sync with people that we um, resonate with, you know. Um, so when I got mine, she was like, holy Mac, I did you know? I said, no, we didn't even talk about it. We didn't even talk about what we were getting, but she got the elements in a, in a different form across her chest. And she had like a little tattoo of um, like her moon. And so that was just supposed to be that way. This one, I basically, um, I kept drawing it and drawing it. I didn't know anything at the time, throat chakras. I had no idea um, about what this was. I had no vision of what this was supposed to be, but I, kept like having this idea that it was supposed to be on my throat and I kept drawing and drawing and drawing and drawing and finally it just came to me and so I took it to the tattoo artist and this is what I need to get and so he's like you know are you sure this is going to be painful and I'm like I I'm I felt this like just like on my forehead it was this real calling to having it done and so um I had no idea what it represented um two short little stories of that is about two weeks after I got this done I went to Colorado to study trauma release. And I stayed with this lady who opened up her house and she's like, Hey, I'm going to go to this ashram at the base of the Boulder mountains of Colorado. It's kind of hidden. Do you want to go? Do you have to be invited? And I was like, um, okay. <laughs> I mean, why not? I'm, 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 she goes, you just have to wear red. And so we went to this place. It looked like a regular house, but once you went into the house, it turned into this, like this big, um, meditation area. This house is gigantic. And so she wanted me to meet the, the Swami. And so when he came up, you know, like you can shake their hands and he looked right at my throat. And I thought, uh, I kind of felt like he just kind of looked at it and then he looked away. And so we go back to the back room and now it's, it's, the room's huge. People are chanting and singing. They give you this book. I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. And <laughs> I sound awful trying to sing it, you know, but on the other side of the pamphlet, it has everything in English. And it started talking about, you know, Shiva, the blue throated God with the universe in his throat. And that made total sense to me. And then when I was in India, we practiced a meditation technique and she pulled out the sheet of paper and with a mandala on it, but it was more shaped like this. And that's exactly what I stared into the whole time we were meditating. So I always feel like the universe tells us what we're supposed to have, you know, it's a matter of whether or not we want to listen, you know, mm -hmm. um, I mean, I could go on and on. This is me and my daughter have matching ones of this. Um, you know, the Venn diagram is so popular. Um, to me, I don't know if it's popular out there, but there's just so many things that, you know, like body, mind, and soul. You know, I have two daughters and the center is the Atma. It's the core of who I am. So it, to me, it always represents, I guess, the trifecta of anything that I want to do, you know? Yeah, and, awesome. I mean, I have more. I can go on and on. <laughs> I have a pendulum chart on my hand. Oh. Um, yeah, that's kind of a... Um, that was kind of painful. Um, it's, uh, it's, I, I don't know why I have so much energy that surges through me. I, I want to say probably because I've always meditated. I've always had that calling. And so, um, I remember when I was getting it done, um, I just kind of drew it on my hand and knew I was supposed to have it. Um, so I did and now it's there. <laughs> That's awesome. So do you ever get any kind of skepticism about what you do? Yeah, I do a lot. Um, well, you know what? I used to. I used to when I was, uh, I used to be really afraid to share who I am, but I'm actually pretty vocal. So I think now when people say, 
you know, is it real? I don't even notice, you know, I think that there have enough people that's, um, I guess, that's been around me, or that has um, worked with me, um, worked through things that they are like, they kind of just spread the word. So I don't really have to go. Um, I don't have to go and look for people. And I don't have to try to explain to them what I'm doing. Because someone else is like, who's a total skeptic, will say, Oh, my God, I did this class with Polly, and she did this. And it's crazy, you just have to experience it, you know, and that's, I, so I don't really deal with it that much. Um, plus, when you look like this, <laughs> you know, it's I mean, once you get a tattoo on your forehead, people are less likely to say anything to you, you know what I'm saying? So I don't really they kind of expect um, something mystic from me now. So so one thing I think is like really cool that you talk about is your belief that uh, women don't have a walk of shame. Yeah. Can you speak more on that belief? I think that's yeah. so inspiring. Yeah, it's, you know, one of the best books I've ever read is called Untrue by Wednesday Martin. And it goes back into history and it kind of talks about um, women, you know, and the whole idea of women having one partner or um, sex being so taboo, you know, um, or in our places um, in society nowadays. So to me, I feel like the only shame that we put on ourselves, okay, is man-made, is society-made. And that's made, it's created to kind of have people um, conform and stay um, or follow rules that they feel is safe. Um, I don't know how to explain this. I'm probably going to offend a lot of people by saying this. Um, I feel like our bodies are really powerful. Okay, let me just say that. I feel like um, there's a huge thing about, you know, men being able to do what they want sexually and it being okay. You know, a man, you know, if, if a man cheats on a woman, okay, it's proven. If a man cheats on a woman, then, you know, he's going through something. And the woman is more likely to stay in that relationship. And the family will huddle around the whole family you know they'll huddle around the man and the woman and, and try to work understand his point of view try to get them to work it out right now if a woman cheats okay the man is more likely to go ahead and divorce him and she's going to lose the support of her family you know and so when i think about that this huge double sided coin this it's double edged it's i feel like it's i feel like it's um i don't know how to say it um I hate to be so blunt. I feel like it's really wrong. You know what I'm saying? It's really, really wrong. I feel like um, we can't deny um, our yearnings, our cravings. You know, um, we are animalistic in a way. We do crave passion. Women, you know, way back in the day, we, you know, they talk about, you know, women that were insane, you know, because they were craving sex. You know, they thought there must be something wrong with a woman if a woman craves sex. But no, it's part of human nature. It's part of who we are. It's the dynamics of who we are. And I think once we kind of latch on to the idea that we own our own sexuality, you know, then there's power that comes with that. You know, if, if a man chooses an open relationship or wants to see other people or whatever, then that's okay. But once a woman says that in the very beginning, then it becomes, she, it's, there's a lot of slut shaming going on, you know, and I kind of experienced that myself, you know, just choosing to say, I want to be in an open relationship, you know, with someone, then a man has a hard time with that because there's a lot of ego involved. Now, if a guy chooses, say he wants to be in an open relationship, wants to try things out with someone, other people, whatever, doesn't want to commit, then women are more likely to just kind of wait around. Does that make sense? Okay. And I feel like it's um, because we're told to, we're told to as women to um, sit down, to be nice, to play nice, you know what I'm saying, know your role, know your place, um, you know, behind every good man is a good woman, you hear all these things, you know, I mean, and I feel like it's actually, we are extremely strong as females, and I feel like um, we give our power away a lot, um, not intentionally, but because uh, we've been groomed that way for so long. It's part of society and there's parts of our mind that's, it's, it's a survival technique too, you know, like maybe we can make them stay through sex. You know what I'm saying? Um, sometimes they feel like the most valuable commodity on a, on a female is sex, you know? Um, 
if she looks a certain way, you know, if she's sexy, you know, then that's a good thing from a guy, right? Um, but then it can also be a bad thing from a guy. It's her fault for looking sexy, you know? So I just, I could go on and on about this. <laughs> You're asking so many great questions. I could, we could spend hours on this. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's awesome. I think, yeah, I think it's really amazing to see any woman who's able to speak out outwardly about it like you do because I think a lot of us think it and understand that it isn't fair and it doesn't feel even mm -hmm. but you can't you there's something that makes society in society that makes you feel like it, you know you can't speak out against that or it seems That's crazy to think that it's just I don't know it's just interesting to it's always important especially to me as a journalist to be able to question what you're taught or what authority says is right. And so anybody who speaks out against authority, whether I agree with it or not, it's admirable. So I appreciate yeah. you sharing it. Yeah, it's, it's a hard, that's a, it's a hard journey for um, the younger generation. I will tell you that it's very, very hard um, to be themselves, to be sexually themselves without being shamed. Um, I see it all the time. I, I have a lot of um, people that are a lot younger than me, um, even like my daughter's age and younger asking me for advice when it comes to stuff because they are being shamed for being sexy, you know, by other women. They're treated badly by other women. Um, and I don't believe that those women want to treat them badly. I feel like they're also in a position and have been conditioned to not allow themselves that kind of freedom. You know, this is your body. You should be proud of your body. You know what I'm saying? There is nothing wrong with the way our bodies look, you know, and showing your body sh should be okay. You know, not saying that I want to go out and mow my yard without a top on, you know what I'm saying? But I feel like if I wanted to, I should have the right guys do, you know what I'm saying? We're so sexualized anyway. It's kind of, it's so hard. Like we're sexualized for being sexy, but we're, you know, we're also sexualized for not being sexy. So it's, it's a hard place. That it's so gray for females, you know, to fall in between those two places of who are we? Why can't we just be ourselves, you know? Mm -hmm. Right. So as somebody who is, you know, in such good shape for their age, mentally and physically, mm -hmm. What is your advice for people on how to keep that youthfulness, um, not only in your, in your physical appearance, but in your mind and body too? Okay. One, I'd say hydrate. Um, your body needs water, not just to stay young, you know what I'm saying? But I feel like it's fuel for your mind. There's a lot of clarity that goes on when your body's totally hydrated. Um, I can't express that enough. I want people to drink more water and to, and to know how to breathe. Um, a lot of people do not know how to breathe. A lot of people are very shallow breathers. They don't know how to breathe. Their lung capacity is very small. If they could allow more breath, you know, more oxygen to move through their body, they would see things a lot clearer. Um, I also say, I want to say eat more greens. I, I can't get enough of, I'm vegan, but that doesn't mean um, vegans for everybody. But I do know the power of greens, the power of life, bringing it into your body, the nutrients. There's so much clarity. It's all connected. There's so much clarity that goes on. And when you, when you are clear about things, um, you, you don't have to worry about, let me rephrase this, if you're very clear about things, about where you're going, what you want, how you see yourself, um, your path, you don't let other outside influences come in, you know? When we go against the flow of who we are, there's a lot of disease in our body, um, which causes a lot of diseases in our body, a lot of disruptions, you know, um, a lot of toxins that start to be released, um, which can age us, um, and not only age us, but change us mentally. Um, so I would say water, <laughs> definitely water, um, breath work, um, pranayama um, is so important, journaling. Um, I can't recommend that enough to people. And people always ask me, what's the first step to releasing trauma? I'd say journal, freehand journal, two or three pages, right when you get out of bed, turn over, write it down. Because when we wake up, we're now awakening to the way the world is now. Um, and we are filled with all this mind stuff that we need to release, all this negative stuff. And once we purge that, um, our life becomes so much easier happiness and that leads you to happiness I laugh a whole lot I laugh a whole lot and I smile a whole lot I um 
I believe happiness changes, uh, changes you and it turns back time, changes your skin, changes your eyes, changes your facial structure, it uh, changes your mood, your posture, it, it changes the vibration that your body emits, it, tra- it changes the people around you. Um, we literally can change our environment just by being happy. <laughs> well, thank you so much. You're, you're welcome. It. Yeah, I, I think you're awesome. And I hope that you keep making videos and keep sharing um, your, while well, you have so many experiences that have built who you are. And it's so nice to hear from somebody who's had all those experiences. Sometimes it feels like when people your age try to give you advice, you're like, eh, what do you know? Yeah. But um, I think it's, it's really, you have a valuable voice. So that I hope you continue to use it. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, um, take care and reach out if you need anything. Keep in touch. I will. Yeah, I look forward to watching um, everything that you post. I want to see more. I've seen a few of things on there. Um, but yeah, put yourself out there. Yeah, absolutely. Dive right in. Dive yes. right in. Thank you so much. All right. You're welcome. Bye. All right. Take care. It was nice meeting you. Nice meeting you.